So uh, this is my favourite author, uh, James Joyce. Um, and I've got a piece of news for all of you. You're all very lucky, which is that um, every single day you produce 33 times as much data as James Joyce produced in his entire lifetime. So across uh, Dubliners, uh, Ulysses, Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man, and Finnegan's Wake, one play and then a whole load of letters, he produced something in the order of 10 megabytes of data. Every day you produce 330 megabytes of data across Instagram posts and emails, text messages, about 330 megabytes of data. If ever there was a case for quality over quantity, it must surely be this. The, the reason I mention James Joyce is because this fact is indicative of a data revolution that we're currently living through, the way in which we both consume data uh, and the way in which we create data. Eric Schmidt from Google is very fond of pointing out that from the dawn of civilization until 2003, we created as much data as we now create every two days. So every two days, as much data is created by the world as was created by the entire world between the dawn of civilization and 2003. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about data and the thing that really underpins that, which is connectivity, digital connectivity. So the two technologies which I wanted to briefly touch on um, and talk a little bit about how they will interact with the built environment are 5G and Li-Fi. So 5G is something lots of us hear a lot about. We know that it's coming. Most people, including most governments, haven't really planned out how they plan to deal with it. But there's one very important fact which is probably relevant to all of you, which is something about the frequency with w within which 5G operates. So 5G works at a much, much higher frequency than most other connectivity technologies. Now, one of the results of that is it's significantly faster than 4G and other connectivity technologies. That means that you can download a high-definition film in about seven seconds on 5G, and that's going to be excellent. One of the other results of it working at such a high frequency is that it's going to be much, much more difficult for that signal in the macro environment, so out in the street and masts, to penetrate through the walls of a building. It's much less resilient than most of the existing lower frequency signals that we have at the moment. One of the results of this is we're probably going to need to see about 100,000 new points to transmit 5G around London alone. And that's in the external environment. Within the internal environment with 5G, we're going to need to try and reproduce that signal many times over throughout the buildings that we all learn, own, and use. 5G is going to be a really exciting technology, but it's going to create quite a bit of headache for many landlords. The second technology I wanted to briefly mention was something called Li-Fi, which is light fidelity. This was a technology developed in about 2011 at the University of Edinburgh by Professor Harold Haas. And uh, it's meant to be something to replace Wi-Fi as our sort of last 10 meters technology for digital connectivity. The good thing about Li-Fi is that it should be able to integrate into something we already have absolutely everywhere, which are light bulbs. Everyday light bulbs should be able to be converted, um, assuming they're running on a power over Ethernet cable, to something that can transmit data in a way that is um, unimaginable to the human eye. So because they can flicker very, very quickly, giving the kind of ones and zeros that are the basis of all connectivity communications, they should be able to directly communicate with devices that are underneath them. Now, why is this a good thing? Well, I'll give you two big reasons. Firstly, security. Light, as we all know, although my telecommunications engineers say this isn't entirely true, but light largely doesn't travel through walls. That means that you can be certain that when you're communicating from your phone up into a light bulb to your online bank, that you are the only person who is in a straight line between those technologies. No one will be able to hack into you in a way that hacking into someone else's Wi-Fi is very easy at the moment. The second interesting thing about Li-Fi is that it's going to be about 100 times faster than Wi-Fi is at the moment. Light travels much, much faster than radio waves. And so Li-Fi will enable us to really take advantages of the many speeds that our phones will be able to use in the future. There are two interesting studies that I, I quite like. One is that when your internet goes down, your heart rate goes up to about the same level as when you're watching the scary bits of Jaws, which is terrible for your long-term health. The second statistic, which is much 
much more pertinent and much more worrying is that the average business loses $300,000 for every hour that the internet goes out. This isn't just something that gives us a really high pulse. This is something that's incredibly punishing financially to businesses. So how do we rate these, these things? We try and look at three different inputs that go into those outputs which are cared about by tenants. So the first one is connections. That's literally how many different mediums of connectivity do you have coming into the building? And over what medium? Do you have direct wireless, fiber, copper, or, or coax? Um, secondly, uh, infrastructure. How well designed is the building? I touched on that with the Manhattan example. But do you have diverse points of entry into the building? Do you have a secure telecommunications room? Telecommunications room. Do you have diverse vertically stacked risers? Do you have space on the roof to put direct wireless equipment if you want? Do you have um, spaces where your tenants could put backup power generators they wanted? And many other factors. And then largely readiness. Um, I, I know many of you will know about the joys of way leave agreements. Do you have those way leave agreements on file? Do you have a standard way leave agreement so you can expedite bringing in a new provider uh, into the building? Do you have schematics that show where all of your telecommunications uh, equipment are? So by looking at these three different factors, we come up uh, with, with a score. So we have five levels, uncertified, certified, silver, gold, and platinum. Um, as you'll have noticed from the way in which I described that, we're not talking about um, exactly the service that we've provided to a tenant on each day, but we're talking about the potential for having great connectivity in a building. I know this will be particularly relevant to you because you can, you can move into a building um, with no, uh, so with incredibly high level of connectivity capacity. But if you're not thinking through sensibly how you can provide good internet, you can still end up with bad connectivity for the people who are in your business center. So if you end up trying to rely on a residential broadband product from BT OpenReach, and you just have one pair of copper cables coming into the building, you can be in the best building in the world, but you'll still have a bad experience to the internet. So why do landlords sign up? You know, the first reason, the most obvious reason many people sign up is because wild certification helps them to attract tenants and speed up the process of bringing tenants into the building. Um, secondly, of course, a wild certification allows people to benchmark their buildings against other buildings and understand how they can make improvements. About 65% of buildings we work with make improvements in between finding out their initial certification level and then when they choose to go public with it. That's something we're really proud of. We love the idea not just taking a snapshot in time of how the market is, but trying to drive improvements in it. And if we can fulfill that public service mission, we're incredibly happy. Ultimately, though, I think many landlords engage with us because they're trying to delay obsolescence. I think the, the great challenge for much of the property sector is how to deal with a, a fundamentally illiquid asset like property um, in a time of, of constant flux when the evolving demands of tenants produce really shifting requirements. And one response to that must surely be fantastic connectivity.